Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Greg Matloff. Uh, Greg is a leading expert in the possibilities for interstellar propulsion, especially near-sun solar sail trajectories that might assist in taking uh, sailcraft to the stars. He's a professor with the physics department of the New York City College of Technology of the City University of New York. He has consulted uh, with me at NASA uh, several times. He's a Hayden Associate at the American Museum of Natural History a member of the International Academy of Astronautics, a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, and uh, he is a frequent co-author with me on popular science books. We've written several books together. So, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and I'd also like to wish Les happy birthday today, and my birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday, Les. Okay. Okay, this, can you hear me? Yeah. To me, this is an interesting, very interesting change in direction. Usually I talk about <clears throat> advanced solar sail applications, world ships, decelerating at Alpha Centauri, uh, something like that. But I came to realize we have to get there from here. And getting interplanetary off the ground seems very difficult in America today, and I suspect in the world. We're dealing with a strange polarization in the American electorate. Many times, you look in the press, they blame it on a certain politician with a blonde wig. It's not really his fault. He and the others are responding to 20 or 30 percent of the American electorate who feel the class. <clears throat> and as Karl Marx said in one of his books more than a century ago, there has never been a class in history in any country that has voluntarily accepted being the class. Because of this, I wonder about the possible future of the space launch system. To me, it's a wonderful rocket. It does have interplanetary capabilities, but it also is extremely vulnerable to the political winds. And we cannot predict what the political winds are. So what I decided to do for this was look at an alternative. What can we do with Falcon Heavy? Uh, we know from the website of SpaceX that Falcon Heavy is able to deliver about 31,000 pounds to Mars. What can we do with that? Well, if you look at people who've exploited this, the two basic exploitations are stupid or maybe suicidal. One of them says, let's take a couple who really love each other, they better love each other, and send them on a flyby of Mars with a gravity assist to bring them back to Earth, I believe 505 or 507 days later. Well, there's two problems with this. One problem is, I'm going to get into space radiation effects in a little bit. In a spacecraft like that, you can spend, if you spend uh, 365 days in space, you're going to increase cancer risk by about 5% for males, a bit more for females, a bit less if they're an older astronaut team, which I'll talk about. You bring it up to 500 days, and you have a very good chance of both coming back brain damaged or dead. Of course, I don't think they'll both come back brain damaged or dead. I think only one will, and the other one will have disappeared and been probably devoured en route. <laughs> That's one possibility. The other possibility, Ellen Musk has claimed that his ultimate goal is to die on Mars. Well. If he flew the second venture, which would take the Red Dragon, I think it's called, and landed on the surface of Mars with, with a small greenhouse, I suspect he would accomplish his goal just a little bit faster than he would like to. Because I don't think, without a great deal of work, that you can take the extremely reactive Martian soil and make it uh, something that we can use agriculturally. The second thing I wanted to do was see if I could come up with a mission that would do something with solar sailing that would get us to use a larger sail than a CubeSat sail. They've all been pretty small. I know they look big in the lab, but if you remember Bob Staley's JBIS article in, I believe, 1990, he was talking about ships to take cargo to Mars on 500-day trajectories, basically a kilometer across. So, okay, 
let's look at this and see what I come up with. Uh, I pushed the wrong one, I think. This is what I should do. <laughs> okay, this basically says what, I, what I'm talking about. I hope you can see it. Uh, we were told, incidentally, what happened. And then it was not only for me, we were said, keep your font size over 30, which I did. <laughs> but then what happens is many of us, like me, work with Mac in Keynote, and Keynote converts the font when it goes into PowerPoint. And not all of us knew that. I will know it for the next time. So I do hope you can read this. In any way, uh, I'll sort of go through it very quickly. We'll fix it, fix and it in post for the videos. You can fix it? We'll fix it in for post the for the videos. Great, yeah. OK. And basically, I am keeping them in space for a year. I would like to minimize effects of galactic cosmic rays, so they should be older astronauts. Uh, perhaps as old as me, but not necessarily. And I'd also discuss crew life support because you'd like to keep them alive. I was able to find a near-Earth orbit, a near-Earth object, which less, less, you may have been the one who told me about the NASA program online. But I do thank you for that. Uh, and I'm told that it's one of the asteroids you're, you're looking at also. It's a very promising one. It is asteroid 2009 HC. And, of course, as I mentioned, it would be very nice if we could do this or other types of missions with um, SLS, but who knows if SLS will be available. I'm assuming that we use the upper stage of the Falcon to launch the spacecraft on its rendezvous trajectory. The sail is used to slow down when we get to the asteroid and to speed up, up again for Earth intercept later on. It's also possible, as I mentioned, that on the way out, we can supplement things using um, lunar flyby, lunar grab assist. OK. OK, this is my rationale. I just talked about this. We do, I would like, like to me, the NEOs are more important <coughs> colonizing Mars. As John Lewis said, the population that can be supported among the NEOs alone is tremendous. We also would like to be able to have access to shielding materials and to a lot of water for propellant, and that's where it is. And finally, from the books that I've written in collaboration with Les and my wife, the author C. Bangs, who's back there, who did the art for it, one very important application of going to NEOs is to keep them from coming here. <laughs> because as you may remember, 65 million years ago, one came here and the big dinosaurs without feathers disappeared. The small feather guys and the little tree shrews evolved and survived. But it must have been pretty bad. You also may remember that about two years ago, there was a near impact in Earth. It was. Um, I think the thing vaporized over Siberia at about four miles, five miles high, and it was more energetic than the bombs which destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If that had hit the ground, thousands or tens of thousands of people would have died. Okay, so this is my basic approach. I went through the launch capacity, the published launch capacity, of what Falcon would deliver to Mars. I looked at information for Dragon, showing the Dragon has a two-year endurance in space, I took its size. I wanted to approximate it as a cone, and I figured the small crew isn't going to spend all their time in the Dragon because they'll kill each other. You need a habitat module, which would also be a multi-purpose <laughs> module. And I said, let's use BEAM. And I had took the information for BEAM, and I assumed that BEAM could be treated as a cylinder. The reason I did that is I wanted to go through the numbers of cosmic ray shielding. And it turns out you get about 13 grams per centimeter squared. And the next thing I did is I went to Suzanne McKenna Lawyer. How many of you know her from IACs? She's a wonderful woman. She is, to me, at least the only Irish woman with her own aerospace company who I know of. And she has led a team, an international team, with Americans, with British, with Europeans, with Chinese, with Japanese, Russians. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. I probably Canadians. Yeah. And they really did the authoritative study and published it in Acta Astronautica of what galactic cosmic rays could do to us and what precautions we need to take. And I based my information completely upon them. And I also realized the time to launch 
is probably during Solar Max, which really sounds strange. But what, what Solar Max does, Sun's magnetic field gets stronger, as well as its output of, of particles. You can shield against the particles with the heat shield of the dragon. But what the cosmic rays do is they push some of not sorry, the magnetic field of the sun in conditions like this push a few a smaller a smaller percentage of galactic cosmic rays can reach the inner solar system and that of course helps. Okay, so we'll continue and once again for shielding it, uh, the basically the galactic but the, the difference is a factor of five to ten between uh, solar men and solar max. It's also a higher limit for men than for women. Women apparently are more susceptible to uh, uh, radiation effects, various types of cancer from galactic cosmic rays. And this comes from modeling. And they do modeling not just on the full human, they do it on individual organs, which is interesting. It's particularly bad for pregnant women or developing fetuses, incidentally. Or de not only fetuses, developing babies. Okay. And basically, you can see, I hope you can see, for a one-year voyage, the lifetime total cancer risk would be increased by 3%. And basically, a three grams per, uh, square, per square centimeter of aluminum shield would be basically give you, give an astronaut a, now, a career dosage of cosmic rays in a one-year trip. After that, he's, he or she is grounded, ain't going anywhere in space, and maybe can't even fly on an airplane any longer. Okay, the next thing I wanted to do, not only do you have to protect them from cosmic rays, you have to keep them alive. And we looked into, I looked into life support. I figured initially a two to four person crew. I looked at the average human daily metabolic requirements, oxygen 0.84 kilograms per day, food 0.62, water 3.52. Partial recycling I think would be required on this mission. I took ISS projections from the space station, 85% water, 75% oxygen, and came up with mean daily consumable uh, calculations, which meant that per person you would need 500 kilograms consumed consumable per year, or about 2,000 kilograms for a four-person crew. Okay, then I wanted to look into other means of sort of, if we have the necessary consumables, what can we do with uh, uh, partially recyclable, recyclable life support? <laughs> My reference for this was Rapp's book on Mars. Uh, Mars flights, and he talks about a six-person crew, 180-day mission, and he comes up with a total uh, environmental control life support, equipment mass of 3,000 kilograms with consumables, the total life support mass for four-person crew is 5,000 kilograms. So I put this together, and I have the dragon mass of 4,200 kilograms, the beam inflatable habitat mass of 1,360 kilograms, the ECLSS mass of 5,000, scientific equipment mass of 640, sail mass of 2,000, uh, total <coughs> payload mass to NEO is 3,200. If you're clever, you'll say I didn't have anything there about the person mass, and I didn't. The person mass, I presume, will bite into the sail mass or into the scientific equipment mass. But once again, this is for Mars. Going to a near-Earth object is a lot easier. Then I said, let's look into sails. Now, this, we can't build this sail today, but it's not that far along. When I worked with Les on the heliopause probe, the helio or the interstellar sail, we were talking about aerial mass thicknesses of about three, three grams per square centimeter. And of course, we had a size of this thing of about 200 meters on the side. Here I'm talking about something a bit bigger, 1,000 meters on the side. And the sail mass in something like this is about 2,000 kilograms. The spacecraft effective aerial mass thickness is 0 0.0132 kilograms per square meter. How am I doing with time? Okay. Oh, great. I'm going to make it. Okay, now this one, of course, you can't read at all. I'm sorry about this, and I'm particularly sorry because it's an equation I derived, and everybody would like their own equations to be seen. 
This is the version I did of the sail lightness factor. For those of you who aren't solar sailors, the solar lightness factor is a ratio. It is a ratio of, cell, of the solar radiation pressure acceleration on the, on the sail to the solar gravitational acceleration of the spacecraft. The sun, I'm sorry, to the sun's gravitational acceleration. The sun is pulling you back, the sail is accelerating it. If it was exactly one and the sail was normal to the sun, you'd move off at rectilinear, in a rectilinear trajectory, starting from 1 AU in a straight line at 30 kilometers per second, <coughs> unless, of course, you had to deal with perturbations from the various planets that you passed. Okay, and what I did is the equation which I put into um, my publication, Deep Space, Deep Space Probes, in that one, I assume a 1,400 watt per square meter solar constant at 1 AU is actually 1,366. And since we're talking about missions close to 1 AU, it's not going to vary a great deal because we're selecting a NEO that's rather close. Okay. Now, one thing I looked at initially, I realized you're not going to do a flyby of Mars with people with this. They'll come back very dead. You are probably not going to land people on Mars either because they'll be very dead in a very short period of time. Is it possible that you could decelerate at Mars in some way and explore Phobos or Deimos? Trip time kills you. You're not going to be able to do that with this, with this proposal. The Planetary Society with JPL did come up with what they call an affordable proposal to do a Mars orbit and, in, and actually explore the most in Phobos. Their definition of affordable is a bit less, a bit different from mine because theirs <coughs> include three or four launches of the Space Launch System, which means if we could launch one every two years right now, it'll take six years to get this thing in orbit and ready to go. So, all right, maybe that's affordable. Okay, I'm, I'm, a space, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Planetary Society. I love the organization, but I have problems, slight problems with that study. I think others do also. Okay, so then I wanted to do the NEO search. I required a NEO in a 1AU near circular low inclination solar orbit. And I realized this cell series, you might have the corkscrew orbits, which are quasi-satellites of Earth. And once again, the Falcon up the stage for Earth NEO would be used for Earth NEO trajectory, the sail would be used for NEO rendezvous, and then placing the spacecraft on Earth to turn. The Dragon returns to Earth, sail and beam could, could be placed in high Earth orbit for possible reuse, or they could simply be burned up in the atmosphere, or land in Australia, whichever you prefer, which <laughs> sometimes happens. Now, I then went to this wonderful website. How many have used Trad Browser? because it is fabulous. What you do is you put in your dates that you'd like to launch, the year. Uh, you put in your trip time, and if it comes up with nothing, it'll come up with nothing. You could have a flyby, you could have a rendezvous in return. And what came up was this particular asteroid with a 350-day duration, duration flyby. The crew would be in the vicinity of the asteroid, five minutes, oh, I'm gonna make it fine, thank you for approximately uh, 10 days. What would they do there? Well, they could, if they have, they have new high technology spacesuits, they would have to detach beam and dragon because there's only one airlock, go out and in their spacesuits, explore and do things with the, uh, with the asteroid. Could they do, as, as I believe Ryan asked me yesterday, I was talking about this, could they do anything that a robot couldn't? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, maybe they can look for fossils. OK, <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. This, of course, is the problem. I'd like to get people out there. But from a scientific point of view, could they, collecting rocks, or doing mag magnetometry or geology, could they do anything that a robot can? I am doubtful. OK, now we'll talk, to, as we're getting close to conclusions, are my results for this thing pessimistic or optimistic? Pessimistic, okay. We base this on a Mars trip. We can do a lot better for a NEO in low inclination, high, low eccentricity orbit near 1 AU. And we could also use lunar gravity assist on an onboard journey. It's not impossible. Sail could be used for aboard also. 
All these results optimistic and pessimistic. The second one, most interplanetary ventures require more mass, and this is something less said I should address when I submitted it. But we're not descending into a gravity well. There's no external, so we don't have an external, there's no external habitat for landing and returning. The only modules are Dragon and Beam. High-tech, low-mass spacesuits worn by all crew members during NEO. Only one airlock once again, and so on. Summary and conclusions. You ain't going to Mars with, with, with people in a Falcon. You ain't going to Deimos and, and Phobos. But it's not impossible that we could probably do a one-year trip to NEO. OK, I'm done. I made it. Yeah. Thank you, Les. <laughs> We do have time for a couple of questions, if there are any, for Greg. Just a note there. Is I'll wait for the microphone, okay. please. Just a note, there is a interview with Dr. Matt Love, with Les Johnson, introducing him online currently uh, on this topic. Oh. It's on the TVIW YouTube channel. Oh, OK. Thank you. Any questions for Greg? Okay, down here in front. Oh, yeah, Jim, Jim, I, wanted, yeah. I wanted to mention, uh, and I'm sorry I forgot it. I was getting concerned about the time. Uh, Jim Benford mentioned that there has been work done on raising sail orbits in, from low Earth orbit to Earth escape in a short period of time by beaming microwaves up to them. And I realized that, that could improve things. Uh, actually, Greg did that. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing it. Oh, no. Greg, you did it. I thought it was you. I'm sorry. Are, yeah. I mean, not only did I confuse the two of you earlier, now I'm confusing who did the work. It'll <laughs> only get worse with time. <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask you, the slide, I think, said you had a sale with two grams per square centimeter. Yeah. Surely that's the wrong unit. That's what? The wrong unit. No, no, I meant per square meter. Did I say square yeah, centimeter? Yes, square right. centimeter. I apologize. Of course well, it's, it's, it's only four orders of magnitude. I know. I, know. <laughs> I apologize for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay, Appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, very good. Thank you.